All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Well, today I'm in this 2015 Audi A6. This is known internally and on nerdy forums as the C7 model, and it ran from 2011 until 2018. I've been using this car now for a couple of days, and it's a tricky car to evaluate. There are lots of things I really like about it, but there's no one thing that I love. I think, for me anyway, that is Audi in a nutshell. There's nothing really wrong with them. They're just a bit, a bit clinical, a bit boring. There's no real character. But like I say, there is a lot to like. Firstly, you've got the styling. Now, I think it's a really handsome looking thing. It isn't pretty like an Alfa Giulia, but it's, it's stylish and sophisticated. I much prefer the look of this to its smaller brother, the A4. The proportions just work better for me. I love the LED lights. They're really bright and clear, and they really light up the road at night. I also love how the indicators look like that snake game you'd get on your Nokia 3210. It's all quietly confident. It's nicely inconspicuous. They're making a state version too called the Avant, and I think that looks even better. I think if you were to stick a private plate in this, nobody would know you were in a seven-year-old car. It looks current and expensive. Especially if you go for an s light model like this. They do an SE model, but that does look a little bit dull. Better still, you could go for a black edition. They look really stealthy and menacing. Moving inside the A6, it's more of the same. It has a really stylish interior. Okay, this one has black leather seats and a black headlining, so it does feel a little bit dark and gloomy. But it still feels really modern. Everything feels really good quality too, including the seats, which are both soft and comfortable, but also quite supportive. I particularly like the layout. Everything's where you'd expect it to be. It's very sensible. This infotainment screen here folds away neatly at the touch of a button. I like how it has a wraparound dash like a Jaguar XJ. I also like the materials they've used. This brushed aluminium feels very upmarket, and you get a nice comfortable centre armrest. The controls for the infotainment are down here, exactly where you'd need them to be. And I also like how they've included a volume knob. Bit of coolio. In case you're wondering where I am today, I'm not in the high peak area, I'm over in Lytham. I thought I'd give this A6 a run out and see how good it actually is on fuel. The steering's very light and normal and a bit vague, but a lot of people aren't interested in that. And the actual feel of the leather steering wheel's nice. It all feels upmarket. As a commuter car, it's probably exactly what you want. It's effortless. One thing I've noticed is the ride is a bit firm. Firmer than I'd hoped. You do find yourself driving this, avoiding all the potholes, so you don't need to visit your chiropractor. I spent about an hour in this on the motorway, and it is the perfect motorway cruiser. I always think about this when I get in a car, which sounds a bit weird now I say it back, but this is the kind of car that I would jump in and drive to London without a moment's thought. I like how quiet it is. It's nice and refined. It's a lot quieter inside than that C-Class Mercedes I filmed with recently. You can't really hear the diesel engine in this. You can a little bit when you're pressing on, but it's nowhere near as loud as that C-Class. A couple of complaints I've got about the interior. The climate controls are a bit too fiddly to operate. I don't like how you fold in the mirrors. It always feels a bit cheap. And Bentley's the same. All VW Group stuff. Thought I'd got sticky mirrors then. Oh, got a mind of their own. There we go. Also, as clear as the font on the gauge cluster is, there's a bit too much information. It's a little bit confusing. I do like how you can change it though, so your sat-nav appears in the middle of the dials there. You also get front and rear parking sensors, heated seats, digital radio, heated mirrors, all those creature comforts that you've got used to now. So it is, it is a really easy car to live with this. Just seen the Big Dipper, we're near the Pleasure Beach. It's a weird coincidence this actually, but I haven't been up here since I filmed with that RS6. That was also a C7 model. Somebody later commented that an RS6 driving through Blackpool does look like the stereotypical drug dealer car which I can't really argue with. But I think I'm safe in this two litre diesel ultra in white. This is a bit more accountanty. There's plenty of room inside this. Plenty of headroom, plenty of leg room, plenty of elbow room. There's lots of storage. You get a decent sized glove compartment, two cup holders. Although for some unknown reason, one smaller than the other. It would make a good family car this because there's loads of leg room in the back. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've been in a few of these as Uber premiums, Uber exec, whatever they're called. If we get a stick a rock, I think you could even give somebody like Peter Crouch a lift in this and he wouldn't be complaining. What's more, it's also a very safe car. This got top marks at Euro NCAP. Moving back to the boot, that's also a very usable size. That offers 530 litres of space and the seats fall down too. Interestingly, that's 10 more litres than you get from the equivalent age BMW 5 series. 
thinking about it, I don't know why I said interestingly. That isn't interesting at all, is it? With the rear seats folded flat, that space goes from 530 litres to almost 1,000. Perfect for those weekend trips to IKEA. They also make an all-road version of the A6, which I filmed with last year. I was really impressed. I was impressed to the point where I'd actually go out and buy one with my own money, which is some statement. They also make a sportier S6, which I haven't yet filmed with, or the RS6, like I mentioned earlier. And that is just a feat of engineering. It defies logic, defies physics. It isn't particularly fun to drive like a BMW 5 Series or a Jaguar XF, but it is quite pleasant, apart from the ride. I can't see it ever being one of those cars that you hate, but equally, I can't see it being one of those cars that you really fall in love with either. The model I'm in today is just a two-wheel drive, but you can get it fitted without his legendary Quattro four-wheel drive system. And on the A6, that uses something called a Torsen system rather than the Haldex, which I'm told is a bit more reliable and doesn't need servicing. Me criticising the ride might be a little bit unfair in Blackpool because I'm constantly driving over tram lines, but I just expected it to be a bit more supple. If you opt for a TDI Ultra model like this, then it's Euro 6, but it means that it's only £20 a year to tax, and it's EULA's compliant. I mean, 20 quid to tax a car like this for 12 months. I just can't think of a single luxury car that's cheaper to drive around in. Under the bonnet is a 2-litre four-cylinder turbo diesel engine, and it does an alright job. This one produces 190 horsepower, which means it'll do 0-60 to in just over 8 seconds. So it's not mind-blowing, but it's not bad either. And it'll keep going till it reaches 144 miles an hour. On the motorway coming down here, I was doing 17-ish, officer, and I was averaging 49 miles per gallon. And to be honest, I was a bit disappointed with that. I was expecting this being the TDI Ultra. I was expecting to get closer to 60. There's also a 3-litre turbo diesel, or a 2-litre petrol, or a 3-litre petrol. So you do have plenty of options. They do something called a 3-litre bi-turbo diesel, which, to be honest, that's probably the one I'd go for. That comes with a better 8-speed ZF gearbox, which will no doubt be more reliable. If you live in a ULEZ zone, then you need to opt for one from 2014 onwards. All diesel A6s from 14 onwards are Sadiq Khan friendly. The grandeur of some of these hotels is just mind-blowing. Speaking of the gearbox, early A6s, pre-facelift models, came with a CVT, which is okay, but they're a little bit lacklustre. After the facelift, then they moved to an S-Tronic, which is a dual clutch box. It's a seven-speed twin clutch affair, which I'm never a big fan of, but what I will say is if you service them on time, as you should, then shouldn't be any more problematic than a standard box. And when you want to get a move on, the changes are instant. If Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are important to you, then you need to look for one from 2016 onwards, where it had another minor facelift. I know what you're thinking, this car's like Joan Rivers. But in 2016, it got even more tweaks. Going back to the engine, the four-cylinder turbo diesel. Now, I always think this of four-cylinder turbo diesels. It's the same with the BMW 520 diesel. It's the same with the E200 CDI. They're just a bit, they're a bit of a wet lettuce. They're good if you want maximum MPG, but personally, I'd just go for the three litre. It's far more fun and entertaining. If I were in the market for one, I'd go for a three litre and just sacrifice three or four MPG. Actually saying that, the three litre turbo diesels can have timing chain issues. Mm, it's a bit of a trade-off, isn't it? The two litre turbo diesel has a timing belt or a cam belt, and that does have quite a long interval. It needs to be changed every 10 years or 120,000 miles. Whilst you're doing the cam belt, you should always do the water pump, if it's one of those pumps that's driven off the belt. They're not expensive, and if for some reason that fails and seizes, then it's the same as a belt snapping, so you may as well just do it. One thing that's always in the back of my mind whenever I'm driving an Audi A6 is that I always think people must look at me in this and think, hmm, I bet he's an accountant. Still, I suppose that's better than people looking at you thinking, hmm, I bet he's a used car dealer. Just like I said at the start, it's all just very, very sensible, very predictable, very safe. My mate has an Audi A6, he's not an accountant by the way. His is a 2 litre turbo diesel ultra automatic Avant, and it's a great family car. But his summary is exactly the same as mine. Whenever we talk cars, he just complains about how boring it is. I guess outside of the S and the RS range, that's just how most Audis are. They're very competent and all, but there's no, there's no joie de vivre, there's no soul, there's no sense of humour. I suppose at the end of the day it's a car, and most people won't care about that. But I would. I think I would. That's why I'd go for a Jaguar XF or a 530 diesel. Used prices here in the UK start around £7,000. You can pick them up for slightly less than that, but you're just going to buy a written off example with a load more miles on the clock. And that isn't the sort of thing you want to be buying. This one's a late 2015 with 127,000 miles on the clock. Great history, cam belt done, gearbox service, all that sort of stuff. And it's an S-Line in a good spec. And this one's 11995 So it is an awful lot of car for the money. 
Well, I think that's about it. I always title these videos, should you buy an Audi A6, for example. And on this occasion, I don't think I've given you a clear answer. But in my defense, that's not really my fault. It's kind of the car's fault. It's a good car, but just not a great one. It's, it's all right. Maybe that's what the A stands for, the all right six. Thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below and I'll do my best to get back to you. I think now I'm going to stop for some fish and chips. When in Rome. Cheers, guys. See you next time.